What's up, Cannabis Congregation? It's 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, which means you're tuning in to Cannabis Legalization News. I'm producer Lauren, and today we're going to be speaking with Nick Earls and Elliot Roth from Macro Solicitors out in the UK to talk about cannabis in the UK. Over the next few weeks, we'll be speaking to more cannabis activists and lawyers to talk about the cannabis policy they're trying to pass in their state or country. So make sure you like this video and subscribe to this channel and definitely hit that bell notification to get updated about upcoming episodes. So let's get right into it. Here's Miggy and Tom talking to Nick and Elliot about cannabis in the United Kingdom. Welcome. We are here with another international episode of Cannabis Legalization News. We're going to the United Kingdom. And with us is Nick and Elliot. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure Hi to be here. What firm are you guys with, uh, and where are you with in England or Great Britain? Or yeah, we're <laughs> the UK. We're in London. Uh, we're at a firm called Mackerel Turner Garrel. Sorry, now we've we recently rebranded ourselves to Mackerel. Uh, we're a global law firm, and we're uh, part of a, a global network that's headquartered Neat. in London. It's awesome. Do you, do you guys feel that you have an advantage? Like uh, Thomas is always schooling me on like law. First off, I have a question: Why, <laughs> why is it called solicitors in England? Like. I thought like prostitution was solicitor, but um... <laughs> soliciting. Yeah, we've heard this. Help a brother out. What, is, what does that imply? Like, why don't we use that? I think you're right. I, th I think people originally were soliciting their services as, as, as lawyers, and they. they but sort of we have no right. solicitation rules in America. You're not allowed to call somebody about a specific case. Yes, yeah, so I do. Wait, actually, I think they only changed it recently. You can't cold call. You can't. Yeah. So oh, wait, wow. then it makes no sense to call you a solicitor, but then. Uh, Mickey, it gets more confusing. What's a barrister? Well, that's, I mean, barristers, barristers, they're pure advocates, Thomas. So basically, uh, whereas where in the States, I think you guys can, you can conduct the, the paperwork of the case and you get to stand up in court to address the judge. Uh, solicitors like Elliot and myself, we can't do that. We have to employ oh. the services of a, of a barrister who basically has that conversation, is allowed to talk to the judge um, and advocate on behalf of uh, our client. So, now, uh, are the barristers the ones with the wigs? Correct. Only okay. in some courts, though, not all courts. <laughs> well, actually, I met a, a, a female a long time ago when I was in a, uh, the Navy in Hong Kong, and they still practice the uh, the English law there. And, and she told me she had to wear. I just, I really want to see that. <laughs> like, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I'm sure there's. I'm sure they they soak them in coffee or tea or something like that. I think um, uh, when they become. <laughs> I've heard all sorts of weird rumors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there's always some stresses going on. We tend not to touch the the barristers' rumors, so we'll stick with the solicitors right now. <laughs> Fascinating. All right, so you guys are some solicitors, which basically means you can do everything a lawyer can do except uh, argue the brief in court. Oh, we we, uh, we can't. Yeah, even that's it, more complicated. Yeah, <laughs> you we, can still we can argue do it, but. There are certain higher courts and you've got to have a ah. week to go and do that. Okay. So like in America, we have like the trial court level. So can you as a solicitor argue to the trial court? I think the we county, can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the county, county, county the appellate, And then could you, do I need That's to correct. be a barrister to be at the appellate level? That's correct. Yeah. 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 Okay. Definitely. And then we have the Supremes. And so like, okay. So then I, uh, do you guys have the three tiered court system as well? Do we get that from you too? Yeah, essentially, we, we yes. Yeah, our, our court is the Supreme Court, and we pinched that one after they they didn't like the the term House of Lords because it was two different people sitting. As oh, the same. Yeah, so we'll talk about the doctrine of separation of powers. I think, wasn't it? Oh yes, yes, we have that here as well. It works mm. okay sometimes, <laughs> but then uh, sometimes, like you can just destroy the whole thing if you have a winner take all system, so that a minority will actually start ruling the majority because it, it just cleaves into two parties, and then like four percent of the people get sixty percent of the. It's it's yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, one it, of the paradoxes. One of the paradoxes. But what type of uh, cases does Mackerel handle? in well all, all over right you guys are just in the, the london office yeah that's that's a good point so uh, we do we're a full service firm right so we've got corporate commercial employment uh property you name it and uh, we specialize in cannabis here in london um but yeah we do we do do the works and the partner firms that we have around the globe are also generally the, the full service matching hours so if we need employment advice from france we call them uh, if we need cannabis advice from our specialists Cannabis firms in the EU, that's that's how that works. And we, we link up. Do awesome. they divide it up like we do in the United States? Like Thomas is just a business attorney, but do you do criminal and business or? Lawyers generally will specialize in, in, in one or two yeah. areas. I mean, we our firm will, will take on criminal work. We used to do a lot of it. We don't do so much now. Um, but yeah, it, it, it can be part of any practice. 
Yeah, some practices lend themselves more naturally to, um, to, to sort of cross-selling. So, for example, um, with the cannabis practice, sometimes we do get involved in criminal work by the very nature of the legality of cannabis, for example. Yeah. So there is the, there's a slight um, crossover, but we wouldn't hold ourselves out to be any other specialists in any other practice other than really cannabis and regulatory work, to be honest. Well, let's talk about the cannabis and regulatory work in uh, England or in uh, the UK. How legal is cannabis in the UK? Mm, that is a great question. So it's it's a bit bizarre. We've got this booming CBD industry in the UK. Right? You can go and get CBD in your chocolate, in your shampoo. You can get it in hair products. You can get it in anything. Sounds very relaxing. Uh, <laughs> yes, that is one of the key selling points. It promotes calm. But we couldn't say that it treats anxiety <laughs> because we've got rules which govern what you can say on CBD products. Yes, yeah, so we have um, the FDA here and they will send letters to companies that are saying the wrong thing about their CBD claims on their websites. I get exactly the same here. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you get lawyers with thesauruses going through trying to rephrase, you know, to make sure it's compliant. Um, but yeah, but on the other side, you've got medical cannabis, um, which is apparently legal, uh, but you don't see it. How do you mean it's apparently legal? Like here in Illinois, like when we had medical cannabis, it was like, here's the statute. We don't want yeah. this. Change yeah, that yeah, part. Yeah. And then it passes both houses. Do you guys have houses over there or how does Parliament come in? Yeah, we do. We have the um, the House of Commons and then the House of Lords has to pass both. Uh, what, what I mean is, yes, yeah, so they did pass uh, a law that makes cannabis uh, legal. It can be prescribed. But it doesn't really work yet in practice. Um, and to give you an idea what I mean by that, we have we, we think about 1.4 million people in the UK at the moment who would use cannabis if, if they could get their hands on a prescription. Hmm. So one year after that was passed, of that 1.4 million, guess how many people have a prescription in the UK at the moment? I'm going to guess zero. I'm going to say 12. More than zero. Tw you know, Tom's closer. Yeah. So <laughs> it's wow. Yeah, exactly. It's about 18 on, on the National yeah. Health Service. And what? 18? Wow. What's the population of the UK? 65. I was like, wait, that's in England, isn't it? Uh, seven, yeah, it was 65, 67. 65, yeah. Yeah, throw in Ireland too. <laughs> <laughs> how does one get the prescription then? Because apparently mm -hmm. there's a lot of hurdles. Yeah, it's crazy. So you cannot just walk into your local doctor and say, hi, I've got a headache. I've got this. Could you prescribe cannabis? You've got to go to hurts. I want the care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got to go to a uh, glaucoma specialist. Monday. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, exactly. But so so they, and I don't know if that's why they've made these rules so you know, pro prohibitive at the moment. I probably not. But Is it's there a stigma? Special. Do you well, guys also I, I think one of the reasons why as well, um, just to pick off that earlier, is um, the the GP a lot of GPs in the UK have come out as saying that they don't feel comfortable prescribing um, cannabis based medicines because there's not enough education around it or they don't feel like they've been given enough uh, information in order to make a, an, a, an objective decision that's that well that's in the benefit of their patients really mm. so that's uh, another contributing factor to maybe the, the lack of, uh, of so many prescriptions so like ignore Israel, like just like we're not going to pay attention to anything going on over there. Like that's, <laughs> I'm just saying there's plenty of information out there with that Google. Of uh, course, of course. I mean, I mean that gets back to. Like, I mean, I, 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 as we're talking about the regulatory regimes, and you can imagine when you're bringing your medicine to the market, there's going to be a lot of data you're going to need to submit. There's going to be a lot of information that uh, authorities are going to want to see uh, in an official capacity as well, and not just something that's hearsay or, or anecdotal. So, do you guys have growers? Oh, yeah. We do. Huge. Cultivation. So can I get flour or is it going to be concentrate? Well, this is interesting that the, 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 um, the, the question with flour is something that comes up quite a lot and we deal with uh, a lot actually in, 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 in the UK is the fact of whether hemp flour, hemp flour, CBD flour is legal or illegal in the UK. And yeah. unfortunately, it is illegal completely. It's still Why? classified as cannabis. It's uh, it's classified mm -hmm. as cannabis uh, as a as a controlled uh, uh, controlled substance in the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, um, and because it still lands in that classification as a Class B drug, it remains controlled. It remains illegal. Even if there's no THC in it, yeah. Well, exactly. let's let's propose to the House of Commons or Lords or both at the same time if we can get dual sponsors. You need to have hemp legally defined and don't use what we did. Don't do the 0 0.3. Uh, that makes no effing sense. What you need to do is you need to do a gas chromatography ratio of <laughs> CBD to THC, and it should be approximately a 20 to one ratio. 
So like if you have some great strains like Lifter, Electra, a lot of the CBD strains that swept across America, they would usually have about you know, 19 parts CBD and one part THC. So you'd see a flower, beautiful, and it'd be about 20% CBD and, and it would be 0.3% or less Delta 9 because we don't understand mm -hmm. the flower so much. We call it Delta 9, even though the flower doesn't grow like that. And so uh, your Delta 9 levels would be below the 0.3 but your total THC levels might be 0.7, which you're still never going to get uh, high from THC. By still, it's a negligible effect on your on your body. Uh, it, 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 it's 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 nothing. It's but yeah, that's yeah. The, that's the genetic ratio. And so instead of using a, an in line, a sand line, 0.3 percent delta nine, which makes no sense, mm -hmm. you use a genetic ratio of a 20 to one ratio. And then those seeds would be defined as CBD hemp. And so like, please do it that way. Don't, we're stupid here. Have you met America? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no, not that bad. Like hey, I am six and a half feet tall and weigh 194 pounds. <laughs> we're still adjusting to the metric system. Um, <laughs> right. But, and I, I got a question. I follow UK trees on Reddit and uh, I've seen though, hemp flower gets transferred through the mail. I've seen somebody who had their hemp flower confiscated and then the police returned it with a note, which blew my mind. Uh, how's that? You know, it's, that? it's funny. It's funny. Uh, the, I mean, the, there, are, there are arguments to be said that, oh, uh, you know, if we put the hemp flower like this or we present it in a tea bag and make it a tea, that it's illegal. The fact of the matter is that you're just grinding up the hemp flower and putting it in a tea bag. Right. There's no there's no magical transformation that happens in the legislation that makes it exempt all of a sudden. So uh, I mean I don't know yeah. Elliot, if you want to. I have that problem with people that try to sell seeds. They go they're souvenirs. I'm like okay I've read the law. It doesn't say dash except for souvenir yeah, seeds. Exactly, it says right. seeds <laughs> unless it's been sterilized and you can't germinate it. In that mm. instance, sure you could sell them as souvenirs, but then you're gonna not want to pay anything for them. You'll be like oh thank you. So yeah. I can use these for nothing. Well, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's so confusing. Yeah, it's, it's very confusing. Yeah. It, 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 it frustrates clients and it frustrates us a lot because sometimes you'll get you'll get people who um, you'll get officials in in the UK who will consider even a negligible amount of THC in a CBD product a controlled substance. And then, that's crazy. Now, is this is this the prejudice issue? Do you guys have prejudice over in uh, in uh, London? I, yeah, I mean, I don't know where it's come from. To be honest, I think the whole government's just scared of weed. I think that's it. It's just, it's been like that for years, right? We've had, right. I, yeah, I don't know. I think so this is a great example with the bug. So why would you ban mm. something that has no psychoactive effect, right? You take the the buds of a of a hemp plant, and there's a couple of reasons it might be. One, they're scared that everyone will get mixed up, and then the police won't be able to enforce because how do oh, you? Oh no! Yeah. You know? Oh gosh! Yeah, who, do who do I arrest <laughs> if it looks the same and smells the same? Who do I oh. hit harder? Why do you yeah. want to arrest the people at all? What, 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 why are you criminalizing your people? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so you get this, 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 this sort of fear tactic, but you can see it even with, you know, the, the public's views in the UK, you know, a lot of the public, unfortunately, or until mm. very recently, were still incredibly scared of marijuana, right? They, you know, they believe the There's same prejudice. There's the why? fear. Yeah. It's maybe, it's maybe not as like explicitly demonized <laughs> in the UK as it might've been done in the U S but I think people in the UK see it as a sort of a, it's quite, you know, sort of a stiff upper lip, you know, turn their noses at it rather than kind of demonize it. It's more like a sort of ugh, a waste of time kind of, you know. So then does nobody like to smoke weed? Because like a lot of the, you know, the, the things that happened in the 60s came out of England and then they went, well, first they came out of black America and then they went to England and then they came back to white America. But, uh, you know, there was that uh, smoke and weed culture in, in London in the 60s, I yeah. thought. And that, but then it was really stamped down in, in the, with the U.S. That was a thing. So I, I guess the the, the, the counterculture movement in the '60s uh, encouraged the, the 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 experimentation of of uh, drugs when they were still legal to a certain extent. It's but then when it, when it flew over to the states, um, you know the uh, the counterculture movement, you know, was was a threat. It was a threat to uh, a lot of the authorities over there. And I think that's maybe where the demonization started and the criminalization began. Yeah, maybe. Has, has the similarities been noted as far as like we, with your 18 uh, medical patients in our United States at one time, eight federal patients, has that comparison been thrown out there? Compare, sorry, to the 
Well, because in America, we had eight federal patients under, what was that program, uh, Tom? Uh, the IND, the Innovative New Drug Therapy Program. It was shut down in the early 90s because too many AIDS patients wanted to access medical cannabis. And then thereafter, uh, it was organized in California. And that's where you get the, the Prop 215 in 1996, uh, I believe. I see what you mean. I mean, I think it's very difficult for them to sort of work out practically what's going to happen sometimes when they mm -hmm. make laws. And... I mean, so the, on the NHS, it's our national health service, you can get it, but it's it's limited to, well, you're only likely to get it for, for chemotherapy uh, related nausea, uh, multiple sclerosis or, or childhood sort of very rare forms of, of epilepsy. That sounds um, terrible. It does, very yeah, rare. yeah. But, but I mean, look, you can- But even then it was a push. I mean, my, my goodness, you know, to make oh, yeah. CBD legal, you know, yeah. these, these two poor boys with you know, terribly life changing um, afflictions you know, had, had to be brought to the point of committing a crime in order for the laws to be changed. <laughs> so so what is the history of the cannabis trigger. then in the UK? Yeah, that's another strange one. So it, it, cannabis was legal in the UK as a medicine uh, well, quite, a, quite a while back now. And we know that it was around the 1800s because Queen Victoria's physician actually prescribed it to her. <laughs> um, then it, it, not, not too far on, you get about 1928, they make recreational uh, illegal and then they in 1971 make um, it completely illegal uh, in the UK. But it gets stranger than that because then they loosen the, uh, the penalties on cannabis in around 2004, making it a class C drug. And then they put it back up again in 2008, 2009 to a class B drug. Um, mm. And now they've made it legal for some people and it's not legal for others. So yeah, it's just a mess. And then unfortunately it continues at the moment. Wow. That. Yeah, there's so much hearsay as well around around possession and what happens if you grow one plant here or if you're caught with that much there. You know, there's, there is the law and then there's this huge hearsay anecdotal um, evidence that comes up around it because people are so confused as to how, the, you know, the severity of the punishment versus the, you know, how 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 popular it is in consumption, you know? Yeah. Well, how popular is it in consumption? I mean, it sounds like everybody doesn't like weed in uh, England or in the UK. We did a study, actually. We commissioned one a couple of months ago to find this out. And uh, it was actually quite surprising. And Correct me if I'm wrong on the figures, but I think it was almost 70 percent, wasn't it, of, of the British public now support the idea of marijuana for medical reasons. Now, recreation <laughs> is is less than that. I think it's around. It's about yeah, it was about 50. It was about 50%, wasn't it? 51. Yeah. yeah. You know, people, yeah. when you guys uh, can start traveling again after Corona is done, uh, go to Chicago and uh, get some weed. And uh, <laughs> buy some proper weed. And uh, and then you get some extra extracts. And then get some edibles. And, and, and then I want you to go back to England and be like, we need to fix this. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I can't believe we could be doing that. You know, Thomas. There's, there's nothing more than you know being uh, being cannabis lawyers. That, that you know that's always there at the back of our minds is the end goal. The end game is, is yeah, we are, uh, right. recreational legalization. You know, and, and then in Illinois, so everyone can enjoy it. <laughs> we overregulate the plant because we have a lot of the same like no, but then we have a history of being free and like you know smoking it and the Grateful Dead and all sorts of stuff. And yeah. then- um, You guys are close so, to Canada as well, so that kind of helps. And yeah. Canada, Canada as well. They, they all, they, they're even more free than America because all the hippies were like, fuck that, we're not going to Trump. <laughs> Canada, we'll grow weed, bro. You know, and that's, that's probably why they were first. But then, nice. you know, the other ones that were still the hippies uh, down in America, they were still growing. And so we had a culture, underculture. And then of course the jazz culture as well. And then yeah. and, and the Hispanic culture as well. And then we had Indian Americans come in and we've had uh, Indians uh, like both in India and then also uh, first generation Americans that uh, have like their, their cannabis licenses. So where is that, that, that real cultural aspect of it has been very, very helpful, but we still have a whole bunch of regulations. So if you want to see how to over-regulate the plant, but still make its commerce so that you guys tell them that there's going to be a lot of tax pounds out there. It's, they, they call them tax pounds as opposed to tax dollars. In London, yeah. Yeah. Ta just tax. <laughs> tax the tax. crap out of it. No, no, I'm serious. The, 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 in America, like if you buy a beer, the most expensive ingredient in the beer is the taxes. If you buy mm. legal cannabis, one of the most expensive ingredients in that is your utility bill and then your taxes. And so as yeah. cannabis gets cheaper to grow from utility bill standpoints, 
the most expensive ingredient will still be the tax. Yeah, it's one, it's one of the strongest arguments for, for uh, legalization. Is, is well, the, and then you realize the that you guys are literally killing yourselves by going out and getting pissed, do you call it? Is that what you call getting drunk? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> literally killing you, and this doesn't. That's <laughs> You tax something too much, it won't get rid of the black market. So I don't, I don't know where the balance lies. Because if you have to go and pay, I don't know how much, pay, you know, forty dollars for an eighth of cannabis, people still just use their local dealers, right? And I don't know. Forty dollars, or what is it? Or is it forty dollars or forty pounds? Because like here in America, like if I go and buy a premium, premium eighth in Illinois, cookie strain is probably the most expensive, or the cookie <laughs> fam. They have different strains. That's their brand name. Yeah, uh, they're like sixty-five American dollars to seventy-five American dollars. Or 3.54 grams. Yeah, 3.5 in the UK, it's only available on the black market. I understand it's about 20, 20 pounds. You know? So that's, that's about 40 ish dollars, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And it might be a little bit underweight. What are your guys? What's the general public's view, though? Because you guys are neighbors to Amsterdam. I mean, like, I, I went, when I was in France, I was a little disappointed that the uh, there was not like an abundance of weed around me. Like, I was oh. like, well, why don't we? They're like, yeah, we got to go to Amsterdam. I was going to say. It, it, um, just, just what, what Tom's just saying, Miggy, um, just because I think part of the reasons why it was not so abundant, and you probably thought that, is because of the culture in the US and because of the closeness to countries like Mexico, where, where marijuana grows freely, you know, with the American Indian culture. Don't forget, it's, don't forget uh, the Jamaicans and then the, the people yeah, in the islands. The, yeah, the, the Caribbean culture as well. So this, is, so this plant has always been around. It's been part of the, of the, the flora. You know, in, yeah. in, in, in geographically, whereas in Europe, I don't think we have any native uh, cannabis. No, uh, it was really like a Shaughnessy back in like 1840 when you guys were colonizing things. And yeah, I should Shaughnessy. call you guys when the country from which you are from uh, was <laughs> in the habit of colonizing. <laughs> and and so, uh, you know, hey, it's. We, we don't have the best past in America either. We, it's, we're still dealing with it. And so um, uh, do you think that maybe has something to do with it? Because it came and like in this particular version where it's the psychoactive as opposed to like the hemp industrial version was from, uh, you know, the Hindu Kush India region. And you guys had them as a, a colony. Do you think that may have influenced the uh, some of it? 100%. Uh, well, you know, most, most, of the, most of the products that we... Uh, enjoy in the UK and around the world come from uh, former colonies. So uh, tea being another leaf that's yeah. enjoyed as well. <laughs> well, you guys did travel the world just from salt and pepper, so I'm just saying. Well, exactly. There you go. You know. <laughs> yeah, no, but the, like I said, the, the, the stigma and the, the lack of abundance of, of, uh, of hemp or, or, or cannabis, the cannabis plants in, in Europe and the UK, probably something to do with the culture and the history as well. You know, something that's never been there historically. Um, there's been no need for it to be um, uh, other than for industrial hemp, for building materials, which was one of the main reasons why people were, were growing it. So maybe that's probably something to do with the, the, the slow movement, the dragging the heels towards a, an eventual acceptance of you know, full legalization. It just seems so funny that you know, uh, America is so influential on your guys' culture, whereas we're your bastard stepchild. You know, that's... Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> How is, America, how is America influenced in the UK culture? Well, as far as you're basically like, we're emancipating ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I was expecting taxes next quarter. No. Yeah. There's definitely there's definitely some sort of US influence in the UK. I'd say. I don't know. What do you think, Elliot? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get a lot. I mean, I don't know, a lot of baseball caps, but then, I don't know. I mean, it's everywhere, isn't it? And then hopefully we'll actually follow your lead on the cannabis front. And that's what well, we're hopefully, this is, well, this is the thing. Yeah, so this is the main reason why we're so excited and, and watching the States because pretty much what's happening in the States, we want to see echoed. Well, not everything. We well, want to see echoed in the UK. Everyone like drunken sailors. <laughs> and so we're thing. broke. And so uh, that's one of the things. It's like, hey, we're broke, guys. Well, all right, let's start. Let's start taxing all that cannabis that we have getting sold out there. Okay. And so now we're doing that. How is your budgetary situation in uh, in the UK? Oh, oh. Big, big <laughs> right? the chest and yeah. yeah, so Corona, Brexit. Um, oh. Yeah, Ooh. we're we're uh, we're, we're wrapping up. Yeah, Brexit. Yeah. So we've got quite a bill to pay, I think. Uh, yeah, imagine that, right? What a fast and easy way to pump some cash into the economy and get it out of people's bank accounts. They've not been spending for the last few months. Just do it now. Like, yeah. Well, well then, you know, let's talk about the trade-off. Like, what happens if you get a caught in the UK with uh, cannabis? So, like, walk us through the bust process. Yeah. You know. Well, wait, it depends. Well, uh, yeah, we've, none of us have been busted ever, so you know, <laughs> we wouldn't know sure. what happens. But what's your incarceration system like? We have several 
uh, people I can point to that are arrested in jail for pot. You know, one prisoner just got out after 17 years who was, who was supposed to serve life. So the ma maximum sentence for possession theoretically in the UK is five years. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not going to happen, obviously. You'll get a, a police officer. And what will happen in a lot of cases, if you're lucky, is that he'll confiscate that and, and that's it. And it won't even be recorded. You know, but officially, um, you'd say, um, it, yeah, it's a cannabis warning. Uh, and then it's a fine, and then it's a caution, uh, and then it's prosecution. So you know, you and also depending on how much you have on you. I mean, if you've got if you've got you know three ounces of of weed on you, you're going to be it's going to be looking for not really personal supply, a personal consumption. So that you might be charged with intent to supply, in which case you could be looking at up to fourteen years in prison. So, mm. but not yeah. life. But like, uh, not life, no, no. But I mean, like Elliot said, it you know that for small amounts that are for a personal consumption. Um, Slap on the wrist, a warning. Uh, if it happens, a continuously a caution, maybe for bigger amounts of caution that will go on a record. Okay, so I'll, I'll pick up some joints when I'm there, but uh, and I'll get a slap on the wrist. What I happens? Hear that. I was, what happens if I was growing the stuff? Yeah, cultivation. Well, it depends if you had license or not. I mean, we could get you a license to cultivate, but um, yeah, really? sure. Really? Yeah, we're going to Is me being American going to be an impediment for me getting this cultivation license? Yeah. We love yeah. you guys over here. It's fine. We need, we, we need the American. What are you here? I, my visa says I grow weed. What? What's your my solicitor? What's fine. You, can tr you can trust him. He's a cannabis lawyer in the States. Don't worry. Really? <laughs> but what's the barrier? What's the uh, um, requirement to get that license? Like, like who? who's the authority that, that recognizes that? It's a home office. You've got to. You, it's and it's a very, very long, arduous process to get a license. You've got to get them to really trust you. You know, there's a lot of security and planning that goes into it. And it takes a very long time. Uh, they don't give them out. Actually, in County, how many have we got in the UK at the moment? You know, it's like it's not many. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, they even they even just, they, there's there's a distinction between the types of licenses for the types of marijuana you want to grow. So, for example, if you want hemp, you have to apply for a distinct license to whether you want to grow high THC. Uh, marijuana, which is actually a controlled drugs license. So the uh, the hoops you jump through are a little bit more stringent, I wouldn't say, for a controlled drugs license. But, you know, for example, uh, if you want to grow hemp, you will need an industrial hemp license. But if you want to extract the CBD from that hemp, you're going to need a controlled drugs license because the handling of the flower and the bud of the hemp is still a controlled substance, as we said earlier. Wow. So to grow the hemp is fine for the license. But as soon as you start cutting and start harvesting, the flowers, the buds, and the leaves need to be destroyed ASAP and on site. Otherwise, you're going to need a controlled drugs license to handle and possess that. Jesus. So, yeah, it's very convoluted and kind of, it, it, it doesn't no make any sense. But sense. Yeah, it does no sense. It's, it's very difficult and it, it provides a huge administrative burden, uh, burden, uh, burden <clears throat> on the government and on the lawyers. Uh, you know, we're here sitting, well, why is this... Why is this so difficult? Why is this no, so that, You're not penalizing people for actually using them. You're like, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to take this evidence. The massive they, irony behind it is like the, the most effective parts of the plant with which to, from which to extract CBD are the flowers and the buds. The buds. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you're going to try and get CBD oil, yeah. and CBD oil out of the seeds and the stems and the stalks. You're it not just makes have so much more sense to actually regulate it in a controlled way so that the person who's buying it, she's not going to get a slap on the wrist even, so you don't have to do the administrative thing. And then also the person who sold it to them and produced it is going to have to pay a tax. And then you can impose mm -hmm. purity. And so, you know, you're not going to be just spraying whatever on this plant. That sounds yeah. like a good idea. I mean, it might actually oh, work. You it's know. the best. I'm not even going to lie, man. It is. It's, it's really, really cool. We're all it's, singing from the same hymn sheet, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We went over to Denver um, as a firm, actually, done a couple of times. And uh, actually, we also went up to uh, Las, Las Vegas. To the conference. So, yeah, it's amazing. You walk in, you guys have got dispensaries. And it's like going into an Apple store. It's beautiful. Glass cases. People come to serve you. Um, yeah, and at the moment, if you wanted to do that in the UK, you'd have to basically go to a black market house alley elsewhere and give money to, to criminal gangs. Yeah. Is, there, is there any legislation or process or effort right now for you guys nationally? Mm, yeah, it's tricky. So very, very slowly we're getting there. Um, it's not really in Parliament yet. We've got a bit of an issue with the evidence base in the UK and also the cost effectiveness. And once we get over that, then 
Yeah, we'll we'll get a bill surely. Uh, well, that's strange. What do you mean by evidence based? Because like that's one of the fun things about Congress is they are the finders of fact for the purposes <laughs> of creating law. And so one of the findings of fact from Congress was that marijuana is terrible, and then it was terrible three times. It was highly prone to abuse, has no medical use, and it's always unsafe. So it's a Schedule One substance, right alongside heroin. It has no difference that this is completely fictional in real life when you actually get to the science because the finders yeah. of fact are the elected officials not the scientists at least mm -hmm. for purposes of law and um uh, why can't you just have somebody say like you know what i parliament finds that cannabis is great and we should tax it moving on how come you actually have to have findings of fact well the, the funny thing is is in the uk sometimes when we do have um a, a scientists or officials who uh do know the facts and do know the science behind it, um, they are not, not viewed upon lightly or not viewed upon um, as, as a welcome opinion, really, because no one wants to face that fact, which is strange. Um, Actually, but, a, good, a good example, Nick, because you think about it, we've got something called the, um, uh, the ACMD here, and they make uh, recommendations to on the laws and the representations of the government or also and the number of times that the government just haven't listened to them and in fact they even fired the chief scientific advisor um when they gave he gave some advice which they didn't like so uh that like yeah. Not, yeah. Not, what was the name of that guy that they fired it's professor uh, david nutt um yeah yeah because i remember professor because that would be in the the press because like yeah, miggy and i've been following cannabis legalization for years and so mm. i remember yeah he was he was the only one who actually studied it he reported the facts as we know them here. They know them in Israel. We basically have scientific consensus on this, and they yeah. still fired him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, I mean, it was in relation to, to ecstasy or MDMA actually at the time. He was talking about, but he's doing fantastic things with with drug science in, in relation to pushing cannabis forward. Um, at the moment, he's actually got a massive registry um, going. Uh, it's going to be hopefully the biggest in the country. Twenty thousand patients they want to enroll by twenty twenty one. Okay. And then once we've done that, they're going to try and use that as the evidence base to mm. have sensible conversations about, about getting the policy change. Um, so yeah, now but, they're going. But, but again, not 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 funded by the government. You know, this is yeah. a this is a separate thing, a separate it's initiative. Showing which is... them the data out of Illinois that goes yeah. like, how much went to the government? Man, we could really use that money. It's you just know? funny how it's, 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 it should be in the government's best interests in terms oh, it of, is. you know, yeah. well, tax, raising, ta you know yeah. raising money for taxes, but, you know, it takes you a guys, privately funded initiative. Oh, well. If, do you guys see, like, GW Pharmaceuticals pushing against or being a, uh, an enemy of legalization down there, or do you see them being in a supportive? I mean, this might be too spicy for you guys. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you said about GW. You know, uh, yeah, I'll <laughs> say. It. It's, it's a good question. So, look, there's cannabis is not in the interest of a lot of pharma companies it's been argued because obviously what are their biggest sellers you've got depression medications anxiety right. medication, nausea medication yeah exactly and then you know cannabis is going to come along and you know mm. take, take away. so i you know a lot of people have suggested yes also um you know gw have a license to cultivate and we export loads of it but yet we can't have it in the uk domestically so there's all sorts of conspiracy theories going on um yeah it's, well, it's easy to like sort of you know deploy Occam's razor and assume that the most obvious answer is that these big farmers are trying to scupper, but we don't know yet in, at yeah. the moment. And, and and if anything, you know the if, if, if any benefits are to come from um, cannabinoids and the cannabis plant, you know perhaps a bigger a big a bigger pharmaceutical company will have the resources to to pull that through. You know, yeah, but, but it uh, will kill the grower culture. But you know, uh, I'm you optimistic have, here. <laughs> you guys have the lazy stoner type, you know, trope. We have that a lot in movies. Like you know, the movies about the lazy Cheech and Chong, Pineapple Express, <laughs> Harold and Kumar. Like you know, to a certain extent, Bill and Ted. Do you guys have like that type of stoner trope in uh, the UK? <clears throat> I was trying to think. I don't know. I, I I'm not sure. I I think I think cannabis, the kind of trope. The, the, the trope that's associated is a kind of like, you know, like you said, the 60s kind of hippie you know, dude that's going on, you know, just kind of out of it all the time, not really focused on anything. Oh, yeah, this lazy the hippie type. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I don't think that's so uh, cemented in, in, in UK culture so much as in the US. I don't know, Elliot. What do you I think, think that's right. No, I think that's right. Yeah. You get a lot of it in the media, but practically on the ground, We've got more, more, more console game, co gaming console. Yeah. <laughs> if you're young enough, you know the rust have seen a little bit, but um, no, it's very diverse in the UK. Actually, we don't have that sort of yeah image like like you see in the US. It's weird that I, I was thinking about that. I don't think we do. You know, I, I guess it's just yeah. 
I think that's quite interesting. Well, how do you US. guys? How does how does society uh, in England uh, look on people who use cannabis? Mm. Oh, they're, they're, so they're, it's, it's almost reflective of the UK government's attitude towards it. It's very draconian. It's very old school kind of mentality. You know, drugs are bad. Yeah, drugs are bad. You're lazy. Um, you know, you should be doing something better. You know, why? You know, it, it, it's it, it, t it sort of tags along with the whole kind of counterculture movement. It's a very, it's very, uh, very old school view. I don't know, Elliot. What do you think? It's kind of like You're the same. Yeah, it is. It's very, it's very like that, isn't it? And actually, I remember yeah, it's someone, very looked down upon. Yeah, someone I actually was buying Rizla in front of me at, at the Sainsbury's about three weeks ago, and as soon as she asked for it, she said, "I'm bored. I've, I'm, I'm at home all day. I've got nothing to do." I'm, you know, making excuses immediately to the cashier. Yeah. Like, and it's like, well, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be like that. You know, it depends why you're using that, but. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing as, you know, people will, uh, you know, I, I guess a, a common consensus in the UK is that you, you label, you lump cannabis in with drugs, everything. Right. Yeah. And that's legal. That's, so you kind of have to. Yeah. You know? Drugs. Drugs sent with a, with a really hard R. Yeah. Um, <laughs> emphasize on the G. Drugs. Well, you know, that's interesting. It almost sounds yeah. like our nomenclature has made it over there. <laughs> but that's something that we have the different, we're, we're a, um, what's the old saying? We are two uh, similar countries separated by a common language. And so the, <laughs> the, the idioms that we have over here are different than the idioms that you guys have over there. So let's talk about what do they call cannabis in, on the street in the UK? Green? Hash, skunk, weed, ganja, po, punk. Just, just so much Hash, crazy. weed, ganja. All right, give us, um, give us like the top four things that you hear and make one of them up, but make it sound British and we'll see if we can, we can, we can figure it's out. Green. Yeah. Green. Uh, green. Forestry. Forestry. Skunk. Skunk. Ganja. I'm going to say like uh, forestry. Yeah. <laughs> that one was real. That one was, that was real? real? Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> but then, you know, that, that's, 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 I've heard the skunk. Like back when I was uh, 23, before I went to law school, I actually um, uh, lived over in Barcelona for a bit. And nice. then I went down to Cadiz for a bit. And one of my friends was, uh, oh gosh, I want to say that he was probably from London and he would mention it as skunk. And so like, I'm like, all right, well, why does weed smell like skunk? And have you, I mean, if that came from there, why would they be calling it skunk in uh, in England and in the UK? And I think it has to go do with skunk number one, all the way back from like 82. And then, you know, this stuff got over into, um, it got over into, uh, what is it? The Netherlands. And so the Netherlands mm -hmm. had skunk number one. It was developed in the late seventies, early eighties. And then because you guys were so close, I just figured that that's why they would, cause like skunk weed, was good weed, right? Well, no, because it's funny actually. You said that there, there, there was a there was a um, an instance. Uh, I'm not sure. A few years ago now, I think, Elliot, where, where, where basically they would separate marijuana from skunk, and they'd label skunk as being this kind of very super strong, super strength weed that was sending the kids psychotic, basically. So it, it, it it's got dank. Um, we call yeah, it dank, in, or like we have dabs now too. So like we've yeah, gone. We've gone it, beyond it was, that. It was very, it was very high THC um, uh, marijuana, but the reason why they, they kind of, I don't know where they got, I think the press just took it and said, okay, we're going to label this as skunk. Yeah, so whenever you hear skunk, it's going to be like, bad. They? Yeah. yeah. This THC level went up to sort of, you know, 20% and people were supposedly used to 13, 14%. And then that's what they discovered causes problems. You know, teenagers, 18, 19, 20 years old, apparently the skunk's what's doing it. Well, no, it, it might be that they don't. It's like the first time you got drunk and you just got way too drunk and then you have nobody sitting there coaching you. Yeah. But do you think it smells like skunk? I don't have a smell of skunk. I'm quite curious now. Wait, you guys don't have really? skunk over in the UK? Uh, do we have skunks in the UK? I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen one. Wow, that's, that's, I didn't even think about that. Shit. Oh, <laughs> you so, so, like so, that. so, Thomas, do you telling me that, that a skunk smells like yes. skunk? Yeah, like, Miggy, do you guys have skunks over in uh, Washington State? Like, skunk and skunk weed kind of sound, smell the same, right? Dude, you ever drive by a dead skunk? Oh, my God. And, and sometimes in the United States, when you're driving past, you don't know, is that a skunk or is that a field of marijuana out there? Like, right. But I would say the field, <laughs> field, field of weed is quite a pleasant smell. So no, no, you're right. You're right. But sometimes... Yeah. I think that's where the, the name actually comes from, skunk number one, because it's a skunky smell, and some people will complain <laughs> about the smell. So yeah. what is the skunky smell in weed? 
Uh, that was a question that took me a while to answer, but you know, we're going to share it with you. And, and we know that it's probably right <laughs> because it comes from Kevin Jordy. And Kevin Jordy is the, sh yeah, he's the shit. If you guys don't know who Kevin Jordy is, you should, yeah. especially if you're into growing. And so he says it's thiols, T H I O L S. Thiols are primarily, primarily responsible for the skunk like odor if we're talking about skunk urine. Esters and terpenes create most of the other smells connected to skunk cannabis. It's pretty simplified between terpenes, esters, and thiols when you have most smell components to make up any odor. Bacteria and enzymes help convert one smell into another. The amino acids putrescine and cavaderine create the smells of rotting flesh and bred breath. Lots going on in the chemical <laughs> cannabis plant. And like Kevin Jordy is uh, like a legit grower with, you know, genetic experience, decades uh, of experience in growing. So that's that's how come cannabis will smell like skunk. It's actually those terpenes and those esters breaking down a little bit. And then it starts to smell like the thiols and skunk urine. Yeah. Interesting. Well, well that's you learn so something new every day. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's probably why they call it skunk number one. So whatever terpene and, and uh, ester profile is in skunk number one, if you don't keep a, keep it really, really nice. And so like some of the, the dispensaries and the cultivators in America will actually preserve the buds through flash freezing or just yeah. be very, very careful with their curing. And then they'll seal it in a, in a jar with nitrogen. So mm -hmm. it just preserves all, and so it won't really smell like a skunk unless yeah. something's gone wrong. Yeah, that's cool. I'm not scared of skunks anymore. If I see a skunk, I'm not going to run. If that's what it's. Well, exactly. Like. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's kind of made skunks a little bit more appropriate. Well, that's just interesting yeah. that you guys don't have the frame of res reference when it comes to smelling a skunk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. Well, I I thought it was something to do with the terpenes. I would imagine so to do with the smell. Yeah. Is, you know, it is. Just, it's the terpenes, but then it's like the breaking down of it all. So that yeah, is kind yeah. of fascinating. But the fact that you have no references is hysterical. Yeah. I mean, we know we know. <laughs> no, stuff is horrendous, but, you know, we didn't know. Yeah. Thank goodness we haven't been questioned on that yet. <laughs> so out here in the States, I think uh, besides Prop 215, CBD has been like a gateway to legalization out here. Uh, you know, Oklahoma had a bunch of uh, CBD stores all over the place before they went to medical. And uh, uh, CBD has been a very big conversation. Obviously, it's legal out there. Uh, first, are you guys the CBD hemp flower is, is it allowed to be coming in from Africa and all that stuff. And, and also, do you think it, it helped move the conversation forward for you guys out there in England? Uh, definitely. I think it does. I mean, <clears throat> even people were scared of CBD products when they first came out, right? It was, oh no, it's cannabis. You know, I actually, even people I knew well wouldn't touch a, a drink that I bought from a local food, you know, place that had CBD in it. But slowly it started trickling through and then people became more comfortable. And then the idea of medical cannabis wasn't so scary. Um, and now we're getting, you know, quality charters for CBD products coming out. And that's helping, I think, to communicate a bit to, to the consumer that these are safe. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's doing wonders. I hope it is. Yeah. That's not that's not to say that the uh, the UK aren't making it very difficult for CBD to be sold <laughs> at the moment as well. Due to this oh, novel, novel foods authorization, I'm, I'm sure you must have heard about this, where yeah. you know CBD uh, C uh, manufacturers or extractors of CBD need to go through a very long and rigorous process to ensure that their extraction methods uh, and the CBD that they're producing meet a certain level of uh, uh, standard of safety in the EU. Uh, very long and protracted, and a lot of these extract, a lot of these companies need to get their applications in before March 2021 next year. Otherwise, their products are going to be illegally on the shelves in the UK wow. if wow. the valid applications are submitted. So this is another uh, regulatory hurdle. But as you can see, CBD is in the market, but now there's another barrier that needs to. So if up. we're if we're trying to get into the CBD Britain market, we need to be calling the the, the good solicitors over at Mackerel. You know it, Thomas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot and Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can we go to find and follow what's going on at Mackerel Solicitors or Mackerel? I'd go to our website, www.mackerel.com. We've got um, all sorts of social media on the top right-hand corner. You can see Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all that. Um, yeah, we've got loads of great content, so please do check us out. You can also, we've also got a Twitter, um, at Mackerel Law. Um, and and uh, I've got my own personal Twitter, Nick underscore the underscore lawyer. I know, I can't believe no one has taken that one before. It's bizarre. But... <laughs> Give, give me a follow <laughs> and uh, give uh, the macro Twitter a follow as well. So very sure. active on that. We'll throw those links in the description. Thanks again for joining us. And thanks everyone for tuning in for another episode of Cannabis Legalization News. We will see you on Wednesday.